I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so Good morning, church. It is great to see you today. If you don't know who I am, it's probably a good thing. I am. My name is Harley Davidson. I'm the preaching minister here at Western Hills. We're glad that you've come our way if you're visiting today. Thank you so much. It's just a delight to have you with us, and we just pray that you are blessed today with the service and our communion together and our time together in the God's Word. And we just want to thank you again for coming out and being part of that. You know, there's a lot of exciting things. Somebody asked me, I, I've got a big bruise on my eye right here, and it's not that my wife hit me. I want you to first know that. <laughs> we, we got home from St. Louis uh, a couple of days ago, and our, so our great-grandbabies come over to play yesterday. And our little one-and-a-half-year-old, he decided to hit me with a baseball bat. <laughs> So that was interesting, a big nod on the side of my uh, eye here yesterday. And I, I couldn't help but, those of us that are a little older, you probably remember the Andy Griffith show and little Opie, and he gets the black eye. I want to say the same thing, he just, ain't it a beaut? <laughs> uh, but God is good. We're glad again that you are with us today. We've come here to worship our Lord and serve our Master and our King. And so, please join us as we continue in our... Oh, I got one more announcement. I forgot that almost. Whew, glad I looked. We have a, a couple that's been visiting with us for several weeks now. It's military family. We're always uh, thankful for our military families, of course. This is Caitlin and uh, Caleb uh, Fanning and their little boy, Lincoln. They are just a delight to be around. They're right back here. We're going to have them stand. They're placing their membership today right there. <laughs> Good. Make sure you get to know them a little bit. They're going to be with us for a little while, so they want to place membership, get started and going and doing all the things that we do here at Western Hills and be involved. We are delighted to have them. If you're thinking about a membership somewhere, welcome home. Amen? Amen. So let's stand. Let's worship together. God bless you all. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We On Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of Mark. So I like to keep notes about different things each week and think about some, uh, some things here and there. We've got a few more over here. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that uh, I've kept a note on and I've been thinking a lot about is uh, this Mark chapter 1, verse 40, verse 40 through 42. So I'm going to read that real quick. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. I want to go back real quick to Leviticus chapter 13, 45. So <clears throat> if a man had leprosy, a person had leprosy, there were a few requirements of him. And this is, um, back in Leviticus, this is some of the requirements that this person was supposed to have. A person with such infectious diseases as leprosy that he's talking about here. And I didn't want to read two chapters in uh, the law to get a bit long and a bit Interesting there, but a person with such infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkept, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. So I want to kind of set the stage. So Jesus is obviously outside the city. He's walking along the, the uh, path here somewhere in the countryside, and this man comes and sees him. So he's a mess. His clothes are all torn. His hair is a mess. He hasn't bathed because uh, he's not going to bathe where other people bathe. He probably smells. Um, he has, has a cloth over his face. Maybe the only thing you see is his eyes. And he's supposed to be yelling, unclean, unclean, everywhere he goes showing the shame of his body, his infection, so that everyone knows what he has, who he is. I don't know if he's doing that or not. My guess is no, because he comes right up to Jesus. And what does he do? He falls on his knees and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus sees him. And what does he do? The first thing he does. Well, this man has been alone. He's been by himself. He's had this disease for who knows how long. And he doesn't ask Jesus to heal him. You notice that? He doesn't ask to be healed of his leprosy. He asks to be made clean. He wants human contact. He wants to be around people, see his family again. And what does Jesus do? It's not the, the first thing he doesn't do is he heals him. The first thing he does is he touches him. He himself becomes unclean. He touches the man and he says, yes, I'm willing. I see who you are. I see what you need. And then he heals him. And as I've been thinking about this, Jesus did something that no one else could do. He made him clean. No one was willing to do was to touch him or give him human contact. Not... Um, anything that anyone else wanted to be around him. 
You know, I see ourselves, I see me in this story. You know, I see a man, I see, we see ourselves as someone with that leprosy, although that leprosy is not an infectious disease, it's sin. The sin is covering our lives. We're a mess. We may look good on the outside. We may be wrapped in that cloth, but we're still a mess. We've been made unclean by that sin. And there's no way to get that sin removed from our lives. And sometimes we have to hide our face and our shame because of our sin. And so we walk around forgotten, alone, and no way to have any, any wholeness the only wholeness that can be given is, is through Jesus. And that's what we remember, remind ourselves of today. The only thing that can make us whole, can make us clean, is Jesus. And that's what he has done for each one of us. On many occasions, maybe when we were young or, or, or older, we came to know Jesus for the first time. But day after day, he makes us clean by his blood. That's what we're remembering today is... Today, he has made us clean once again by his blood. His sacrifice that he made for us. He provides that healing touch, that forgiveness, that relationship, an opportunity to have a relationship with God again. Relationships. So let's stop and give thanks for what he has done for us. Jesus, thank you so much for the willingness to become unclean, the willingness to take on my sin, the willingness to, be, to, be, uh, to meet me exactly where I'm at, to be where, where I'm at today. Father, thank you for making me clean through Jesus' blood. Thank you for the human touch that Jesus provides, the touch that each of us desires willingness to have a relationship with God. We say thank you for giving us, providing that opportunity for us. And I pray these things through Jesus' name. Amen. continue our prayer. Father, there's nothing we can do to become clean. Father, we may look good on the outside. We may be showered and hair kept and clean clothes and un not torn. But knowing that the sin that encompasses us is the uncleanliness, the leprosy that we have. Father, the only way to get rid of it is through Jesus. Father, thank you for providing an avenue for us to have a relationship with you again. I pray these things through Jesus' name. Amen. They're offering baskets. <clears throat> In the foyer, we're going to say a prayer for those offerings today. Father, thank you for so many things that you've given us, the freedom from sin, ability to have a relationship with you, and Father, for so many blessings, family, our homes, our jobs, those countries that we live in, the cities that we live in, Father, and a fellowship that we have with each other, Father. We know that those are all blessings from you. Father, accept our monetary blessings that we've given back to you today. And Father, help us strive um, to be uh, more like you each and every day. I pray these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Get right, church, and let's go home. Come on, get right, church, and let's go home. Come on, get right, church. Get right, church. Come on and get right, church, and let's go home. You know that I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home. I'm going home. You know that I'm going home. Because
calls that an evening train might be too late. That evening train might be too late. No evening train. That evening train. You know that an evening train might be too late. Everything will be alright for back back train. Gotta get the load. Come on train. Back back train. Gotta get the load. Come on and back back train. Back back train. Back back train, you gotta get your load. Everybody, 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 get right church and let's go home. Get right church, come on and get, get right church. If you wanna go home, get right, get right church, get right, get right church and let's go home. Get right, get right, oh and let's go home. Come on and get right church if you wanna go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, you wanna go home? Get right, get right, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. get right, church, and let's go home. Well, good morning once again. That's pretty weak, but good morning once again. That sounds much, much better. Man, it's good to be back. It's good to be a part of such a wonderful family that lets you get away for a while and uh, just enjoy family in other, other places. So I'm thankful for that. I want to thank Mike for uh, taking care of uh, preaching for us last week. I know he did a great job. I heard a lot of good comments. Appreciate and love him so much. And, and his, um, his heart for the Lord always is just right. I appreciate that much. Um, so today we're going to talk about communication. There was a teacher that asked her students, elementary class, of their favorite animal. What their, what's your favorite animal, she said. All the kids started answering, and little Johnny raises his hand, and, and of course, his mom and dad always taught him to be honest, and so he raised his hand, and he said, fried chicken. <laughs> All the kids laughed, but the teacher didn't, of course. <laughs> so she sent him to the office. So he gets to the principal's office. This sounds a lot like me when I was a kid, but anyway, he got to the principal's office. He told the principal what he said and everything. The principal laughed, and he just simply said, go back to class and don't do that again. He said, all right. So the next day, the teacher comes to the class, and the students are there, of course, and she says, what's your favorite live animal? She wanted to make sure she got that across. All the kids began the answer, and of course, little Johnny simply said, a chicken. And she says, why did you say a chicken? He said, because you can fry chicken. <laughs> back to the office again his mom and dad taught him to be honest so he goes back to the office tells the principal the principal laughs once again and sends him back says don't do that again okay whatever so the next day she comes in they, she asked the class the teacher asked her students to tell her what famous person they admired the most and little Johnny raised his hand and said Colonel Sanders We know where little Johnny wound up, right? I think what they had there was that what we might say is a failure to communicate, right? And so we're going to talk about this communication today. The dictionary tells us that it's imparting or exchanging information, which is important in our lives. We know that. And that is true. However, one must be careful because we know that all information is not true information. We are called to communicate as Christians, but we are to called to communicate the truth from God himself. We're called to do that. And going to the well of communication, I believe, with the Lord can help us stay on track. Because it's easy for me, I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to get off track. With all the information that we're bombarded with in our world today in this instant news cycle that we find ourselves in it can be real easy to be off track. Paul asked the church at Colossae, he asked them to pray for him in one of his letters there to the church at Colossae. And he says, pray for me that I would be able to deliver the message clearly. He's talking about communicating, communicating the truth of God's word so that people would understand because he knew that it was essential and it's essential for us because there is something that is true and there's something that is false. And in God's word, it is the truth. 
period. God teaches that in His Word, and we must crave that in our lives. Perhaps you've heard these words before. I know in the counseling that I've done over the years in ministry, I hear people say, we've just grown apart from each other. And actually, I believe in what they're actually saying is, we don't communicate anymore. Oh, they talk, but they don't really communicate. And as those of us that have been married for long periods of time, we know it takes a lot of communication. To keep a marriage healthy, it takes a lot of communication. And it doesn't mean that you always get your way, but it is that you can understand where your mate is in life. It's important. It's important for all of us, however we know. It's for the mother and the child. It's important to communicate. The student and the teachers. Friend to a friend. A husband to a wife. An employer, employer to an employee and maybe leaders to followers, and ministers to members, and certainly from God to man, you and I. The list goes on and on. Because we are created to communicate. God has designed us that way. It's to communicate. You remember when they were building the Tower of Babel, and, 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 and they were so full of themselves that they thought they could get to God, and God struck them with a different language. It's an amazing story that takes place. They're talking with each other and understanding each other completely. And in, in one moment, there's like ten different languages going on. The person speaking it knew it completely and understood it completely, but the person talking to them, it just sounded like gibberish. And God knew the communication could get confused in the wrong way or the right way. Communication is important. The struggle we often have again, is that failure to communicate or communicate correctly with each other. Oftentimes, I don't get communicate to you correctly. I try to. I, I pray about that. I study the Word and I study the message that I've written or, or looking at and I, I try to communicate that to you and, and undoubtedly someone takes it differently. You can hear the same message and some can be offended by it and others would be uplifted by it. My prayer is like Paul to the church of Colossae is that I would pray that he would communicate or I would be able to communicate to you clearly of what it is that God's word says because that's what I will be held responsible for. I can't help the way you perceive it. I can't help the way that you understand it or try to understand it. But I am responsible to, treat, to teach it in the truth of God's word. And I try my best to do that and communicating to you. And I thank you for putting up with me for these past 30 years and trying to do so. I would suggest to you that many, if not most, of our problems that we face in life would simply fade away if we were able to communicate correctly. However, to communicate correctly, one must first have truth connected to it, not just an opinion. Anybody got an opinion? Yeah, I thought so. Now, I think that we would all agree that if one has the truth connected to, connected to their lives and they connect it with what is going on and trying to articulate what it is that they're trying to get across, it can make all the difference in the world. However, once again, don't be fooled because you can tell the truth. You can tell the truth, but it doesn't mean that everyone's going to believe it no matter how well you articulate it. Some people just choose to believe a lie over the truth. They just choose to. And it's our choice as well to believe what the world says or what God says in His Holy Word. God says, here is what I say. Which one will you take? What you think or what I say? There are many vague things in the Bible, since, and, and what I mean by that is that they're, they're not uh, uh, these salvation issues. It's a likes or dislikes. But then there are those, if you will, that are <laughs> in the red letter. And they are salvation issues. And those cannot be strayed from in God's Word, nor can they be strayed from from a pulpit wherever the person's preaching. Matthew, and Jesus addresses this in Matthew chapter 13. It's pretty lengthy here, but he addresses it. This is why I speak to them in parables. Parables speak to all generations. It's wherever you're at, they can speak to you. Yet, Jesus is the first to speak in the parables. 
And he says, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He says, let me tell you, this is what Isaiah was talking about hundreds of years ago. This is how he said it. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. God is in the healing business, as David mentioned there earlier, in that cleansing business. That's what God wants for all people. That's why he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world, not just yours, not just mine. He longs to cleanse them, but a person must turn. They must open their eyes, they must open their ears to hear so that they can have a heart movement, if you will. But blessed are your eyes, he says, because you see and you, your ears because they hear. Are your eyes seeing what God would have you see today? Are your ears open to what it is that God has for you in your life? And what God is trying to communicate to you in your walk with Him? Are you truly walking with your eyes wide open and ears? There's a reason why He says, be quick to speak. No. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And I have to remember that oftentimes in my own life. But we have to come to understand that God's communication with us is based on truth only, not on an opinion, truth only. This is where many people are misled by Satan. This past week while we were there in St. Louis, I took some time to just jot down things. God speaks to my spirit, and, 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 and you know, they, it's not that I hear the voice, but there's something that's moving within you, and you have to jot it down, you have to write it down. And if you've ever done a paper, and say in college, when we were in college, and you, you know, they give you a subject matter, and you, you, but then something comes to you. If you've ever taken a creative writing class, and I have, and, 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 and it's important, and, but, but God does that in our lives as well. And so I wrote most of this message probably there, jotted down a few things and tried to put it all together on Friday. I think we have to come to the understanding that God's communication with us is based on truth only, not on opinion. And this is where many people get misled by Satan. They drink from the well of the world which leads to disinformation instead of the well of God which leads to truth, correct information. They believe that they can communicate with God as though they would with each other. We communicate with God similar in the way we communicate with each other. But actually it is different. It's different in the sense of this. I have an opinion, you have an opinion. This sounds like politics. And in our opinions what we try to do is we try to sway one another to our liking or our thought process. That's what we do. We're humans. That's understandable. An opinion is not always based on facts and knowledge, politics once again. It's oftentimes it's based on a lie or just feelings or even oftentimes self, selfish, motiva uh, selfish uh, motives that they might have themselves. God doesn't have opinions. God is truth, Period. Jesus said, I am, the way, the uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That is not an opinion. That is fact. And someone should say amen. amen. I praise God for that because that's the one that I put my trust in. If you're a child of God, you said, I trust that is truth. I trust that Jesus went to the cross. I trust that he went to a grave. I trust that he rose from the dead. And I trust that someday when I leave this planet, God is going to call me home and give me the great reward called heaven someday. I trust in that fact. That's not an opinion. Those that tell you that there are other ways to heaven, it's a lie. And yet many people think that it's okay. They believe that God changes. 
And He is okay with the sin that you are living in. And He will allow that because He has somehow come to, God has somehow come to understand that we know better than God. Foolishness. Beware. Beware of man's opinion and Satan's tactic. It can only lead to destruction. And many follow it, Scripture says. You cannot get a godly result with a worldly approach. You can only get a godly result through the right relationship with God. And that only comes through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's the only way it happens in our lives. And allowing Him to communicate to you, which leads to the truth, that you're a sinner and you're lost. But Jesus is a redeemer and you can be saved. You say, that's not very complicated, is it? Doesn't it make sense that we should have to work? Doesn't it, everything else we have to work for, doesn't it make sense that we have to work for it? No, you have to surrender to it. And after you surrender to it, then your works become of God. There are God's nature within you. Now you want to just please God. You want to do right even though you're going to fail. Even though you're going to daily do something that is outside of a boundary if you will. And, and God is still there saying come on. Get up. It's okay. I forgive you of that when you repent. God is an awesome God. He doesn't make this thing difficult. Man does. But God hasn't. The struggle many Christians have is that they have an opinion about God. Do you have an opinion about God? He doesn't want you to have an opinion about Him. He wants you to know Him. He wants you, God, the creator of all living things, including you and me, God, that God wants you to know Him. He doesn't want you to have an opinion. He wants you to know Him. John chapter 17, 1 John chapter 3 talks about that somewhat. If you only have an opinion about God, what will happen? This is what happens. If you only have an opinion about God, you will struggle in your repentance because you will try to justify your sin through your view and not His holy word, which is truth. And that's what many people do. Well, I think this one's all right. I think He'll give me, it's all right, just a little bit here, and then we won't repent. Because we justify it by our opinions, not the word of God, which is truth. Truth is not based on your thought. Truth is not based on your thought. You may have truth in your thought, but it's not based on your thought or the view of something. It comes through God, whether it be from his spoken word or from his creation, his creative hand, his creation itself. God doesn't ask you for your thought about something. He doesn't ask you for it. He doesn't mind that you try to tell him that because he knows that we're human. God, I think you ought to do this. Do you ever tell God that? God, this is the way I see it. This is the way you do it. It's okay and I'm good to go. And when you do, I'm real happy. And when you don't, I'm real sad. Anybody else but me? You ever try that approach? I don't know if God laughs, but I think sometimes he laughs really hard at me. I think he calls his son over, Jesus, come here. Did you just hear what Harley said? I struggle with that sometimes. I don't know about you, but I know I do. He asks for not your thought, he asks for your obedience. That's what he asks of us. Read it, because it is the truth, and now just obey it, or believe the one that wrote it. For your belief in him and his word gives you not only the right thought, that's the key, because when you read the word and you get his word in you, now you have the right thought. Not your thought or someone else's thought or your grandmother's thought. It becomes now the right thought because it's from him. And that truth sets you apart. It sets us apart from those who teach falsehood. And there are many claiming that it is truth all the time. Truth is not truth because someone posted on the internet, folks. We need to always remember that. It sounds good. My dad had a second grade education, couldn't read, could barely scratch out his name, Bob Davidson. But I will tell you, he, he, he was a pretty smart guy. He would always tell me, he would say, a piece of paper will lay there and let you put anything on it. 
And I think that's what we see sometimes on the internet or the web, whatever, whatever terms you use. Because it's real easy for that to happen. It's real easy behind the scenes to put in something. You're ugly, you should kill yourself, and kids kill themselves. But it's not the truth. Because we are created in the image of God. You are worthy. So much so that Jesus died on the cross for you. And that you are precious in God's sight. Young people, don't you ever believe the lies the world will tell you about that. God created you. God loves you. And he wants you to know the truth. And his truth will set you free. Give me an amen. amen. Now I've discovered in life the hardest thing to do with people is not necessarily to convince them that they need to be saved. Most people will tell you they want to be saved. And that, not that they, uh, that at all. The hardest thing is to convince them that they are lost. It really is. It's, it's hard because what we do as humans, we often listen to someone else besides God, or what we do is we compare ourselves to someone else that is worse than we are. And God says if you play that game, you'll always be in the wrong court. The word teaches that in Galatians. I wrote down through three or four verses there. There's just the tip of the things that God says. Write them down. Learn them. Because the world has and is communicating to them, to us, that God just loves them. And he does. That God loves them. And that in that course of his love, he, that love overrides their sin. And that they are okay to do whatever they choose to do. God's love doesn't override your sin. Someone has a problem with that. Your acceptance of the sacrifice he offered through his love and the turning from your sin is what saves you, my friend. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have this eternal life that he talks about. But that you believe in him, that doesn't mean you believe a part of what he says, but you believe it in whole of what he says. Let's look at the book of Ephesians for just a moment. It's an interesting book. We studied it many times in Bible class, and this is a lengthy reading. Because some people would say, well, I don't know about that. Once again, we'll go to our opinions. I just soon go to God's word. How about you? I would also encourage you to read Romans chapter 1 and see what you think. Most people tear it out of their Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, and you're futile of your thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, tell me if these next couple of phrases doesn't sound like it could be something in a headline in our newspapers, if they make them anymore, I don't know. Having lost all sensitivity, could that not be a headline in our papers today? Do you know why? It's because our world has lost its sensitivity. So that's what he says. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to a sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. Could be another headline, couldn't it? Sure it could. And then he goes to verse 20 and he, he gives us his hope. He gives us where it is, the truth is, where, where we can, watch what he says. That, however, is not the way of life you learn. Someone should say, praise God for that. That's not the way we've learned it. Did we learn that and say, hey, that's what I want in my life? No, when we accepted Christ, we learned something different. This is the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. You see it? He backs it up and he says, this truth is in Jesus and we believe that as children of God and we should shout, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. And he goes on to say, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. In other words, it was something you were, but it's not something I am now. Praise God, I'm not what I used to be. 
Anybody can testify to that? I mean, my thinking was always perfect since the age of six. How about you? Okay, God, I repent of that one too, but here we go. This former way of life, to put off your old self. That's what we put on Christ in baptism. We put him on. It's a whole different thing. It's a, it's a different coat. I don't know about you, when I was a kid growing up, you know, we were poor, and, and I thought we were real poor until, until I met Donna's family, and they were really, really poor. One light bulb in your house is pretty poor. I thought, we're, we're, we, the rest of them burn out? No, there's just one. Really. The, re, the, the refrigerator was the creek. But when I was growing up, and we, we, we got all hand-me-down. Anybody know the hand-me-down rule? Okay. A lot of these young kids today, they have no clue what that means. I'm not wearing my cousin, first cousin, third cousin, sixth cousin. I'm not wearing those jeans because they're ugly. But they'll go buy them for $80 or whatever, right? So, so I remember, you know, when we got clothes, I was telling my grandkids, we took them shopping, as we always do, and we took them, they got a few things while we were up there in St. Louis, and, which was great, and I got to pay. But anyway, it was great, and... Uh, <laughs> But when I was, I was telling my grandkids, you know, you, you know the, the, the stories we tell our grandkids, you know, I walked to school 15 miles uphill both ways, whatever. And, it, it, but then, so the kids don't really. But when I was a kid, we would go to Kmart. Now, Kmart, we lived in, I lived in Michigan, and Kmart was about 50 miles from our house. That's a good long distance. And we would always go before school started. We'd get a new pair of tennis shoes. We'd get a, maybe two pairs of pants and a couple of shirts. If you were lucky, and of course, you got to get the clean underwear, so you get those. So, but, but I, I kid you not, I don't know about you, but I did, because when we, hey, when we got to the car, we weren't waiting until we got to Almont, Michigan. We were doing it downtown Detroit, man. We were stripping off, left the underwear on, stripping off, and we were putting on all the clothes. Just putting on the right clothes makes you feel different. Putting on something new makes you feel like, wow, I'm looking good. I feel good. Na 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 na, right? I feel good. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Well, that's what he's saying. You're taking that old stuff off. You've been to Kmart, but you've been with Christ. You've taken all that stuff off, and now you put all this new stuff on. You should feel good. You should feel good about what he's got. What he's allowed you to put on. Read the prodigal son story. Takes it off his robe and puts it on his son. How do you think his son felt after that? Because he'd already poured out his heart. I'm not worthy. I'm lost. I'm just, I'm terrible. Just make me a servant. And God said, no. You've come. You've repented. You are my son. Here is my robe. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you get dirt on it. Walk into the house. You are my child. I've redeemed you. That's what he's done for us. I have no idea where I'm at on this page, but we're going to go on anyway. It's, it's, it's that with your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, because that's what we were. Deceitful desires means we're in it for self. Self-gratification. What that earlier verse was talking about. I crave that more than I crave God. And because I crave that more than I crave God, but I want God, I'll simply say that craving is not wrong in the eyes of God, and everybody's okay with it. You're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, we're all going to heaven and the world, boat, clap, clap. Doesn't work that way. To be made new in the attitude of your minds, because that's where it starts. Because there's where your thought pattern comes from. There's where the communication comes in. You have to, somebody imparts you something, you it's communicated to you, runs through your mind, you accept it or reject it, and then you play it out. And that's what God's saying. He's, now you've got this attitude of your mind, it's changed, and to put off, or, or to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What's it telling us? So much, but let me say this. Your communication or information used to be a, from the world. It was from a worldview standpoint. But now your information, your communication comes from God, which is leading you to truth, not an opinion any longer. You see it? 
And that truth is now giving you a thing called eternal life. Or it has set you free because of God's truth, spoken truth in your life. So you see, your communication with God is the most important thing. You have going for you. Why? Because it leads you to a godly righteousness. Not yours, but in Jesus that David talked about on the cross, that shedding that blood. We, we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's His righteousness, not mine any longer. Why? Because I've put on the new. I've put on Him. I've taken me off. I've put on Him. And that's the beauty of God. He said, you're my child. And when the world tells you, and they will, I promise you, the world will, if you tell them that, the world will tell you, that's your opinion. That's your opinion about God. That's your opinion about God. I've heard that many, many times. Well, let me say this and be very clear on it. You can then simply say to them, no, that's not an opinion. That's a fact, because my God said so. And what does that do for you? It frees you. Frees you from what? If they have a problem with that, they have to take it up with God, not with you. See, if you only give them your opinion, they can argue with you. If you give them the truth of God's word, you're free to go. I love that fact. Hey, take it up with God. Well, I'm just, well, go ahead. It's all right. I think you could, well, go ahead. God said, because we stand on the truth of God's word. Give me an amen. All right. Now, don't misunderstand because somebody, again, I want to be clear and we'll close. God wants us to communicate with him. Oh, yes. I love that fact. He tells us to communicate with him continually, in fact. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, says pray continually. It means communicate with me continually. T continually tell me. He longs for us to tell him all about our struggles. Remember the old song where you say, Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide till the day is done. And there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Now, I'm not a singer. But there's nobody like Jesus. Nobody. So he loves for us to tell him all about our struggles, our hurts, our pains, and yes, even our ambitions in life desires just as our children tell us our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will continue to tell us of their pain their pain their hurt their struggle and yes their ambitions or desires in life that is natural for us to do that but we are God's children and he longs to hear from us and we are given permission to crawl up into his lap and pour our hearts out to him. Praise God for that. But we must remember, we must, must, must remember that when we are finished with our conversation with God, that he hasn't changed, but hopefully we have. He is God. He is the author, the perfecter of my faith, which I have said that is in him and his holy word. He communicates through his word and, and through his touch. As David once again mentioned, he touched the man with leprosy. He wanted to make sure that he knew the story wasn't about the leper. The story was about you and me. So that's what David brought that across so well. It was a message in itself. Is that he was willing and is willing to touch you in life. It's an amazing God. An amazing God. He communicates to us. A trip to the well of communication is vital for, for us. To stay strong and healthy in our relationship with him. That's why I say the well of communication. Because why? We, you and I, we communicate with the world and people around us so often, every day. We communicate with them and if we're not careful... I can become more like them instead of like him. A failure to communicate with God can never end well in one's life. Or a nation. It doesn't end well for those that don't communicate with God correctly. 
May we be known as people. May that be said of us. May we be known as people that crave communication with one, that we crave the communication with the one that holds our future. For if we truly long to be Christian, Christ-like, that we say that we want to be, then a trip to the well of communication is never wasted, is it? Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. May we stand on it because it is truth. I know I want to insert my opinions many times, and forgive me when I do, Father. But help me to study your word so that my thinking is less of me and more of you. Thank you for allowing us to be able to communicate with you and tell you all about our hurts, our pains, and our things that we're going through in life. And yes, certainly our sin. And may we just puke it up, and as we leave, Father, may we know that you haven't changed, but we are forgiven because you're a God that said that you would. And we stand on that truth, and we thank you, Father. May those that are here today that have heard your word, Father, if they're touched to be moved, to come to know you as Lord and Savior, I pray in the name of Jesus that they do not wait, that they realize that your word is not an opinion, it is truth and that you will give them salvation as well today. And for those of us that know that we are saved people, help us to act like it. And then when we are wrong, let us search your word, or when we think we're right, let us search your word so that we might find the truth. And if we find the truth, help us to repent, say that I was wrong, knowing that you forgive us, and knowing that we got a new coat on, and we're cleaned up once again, and can go about the world. And as we study the world around us, Father, may we always hold it up to the truth of your word. If it doesn't match up, may we run, flee. If it matches up, then that's just fine. Thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy and grace. In Jesus we believe. Amen and amen. If you need to respond, now's the time. You can come as we stand and sing.
Thank you, Harley, for sharing the word with us today. And if you would, please stand. And I, we're going to read a verse out of Psalm. You know, David really trusted the Lord. He didn't always make good decisions, but he had a trust in the Lord. And, and in life, you know, we can know that all things are in God's hands. So let's read this together. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Would you pray with me? Father, we, uh, we do thank you for your word. And uh, as Harley said today, uh, that came from your word, let us have ears that hear and eyes that see, and may our hearts not become callous, Father. Father, we do put our complete trust in you, and we surrender to you, and we place all things in your hands. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And Father, for those who are, are sharing in the meal, we just pray for your blessing to be on our, the fellowship that we will have and the food that is provided. We thank you so much for that. Watch over us this week, and may we honor and glorify you in all that we do. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.